Okay, everybody, back for one more, and this will be the last of our uh, narrated lectures for this unit. Um, the unit test is coming up, so um, let's get to it. I'm going to go pretty fast, especially through these definitions. All right, so first we start with states' obligations to each other. That is also part of the federal system. It's not just national government and state governments. It is the states uh, working together as well and the obligations they have. That Most of that comes from the Full Faith and Credit Clause, Article 4, um, and we're talking about um, the fact that <clears throat> states have to recognize um, the public acts records and civil proceedings are in other states. Those are essential to a functioning economy and a society. So the idea is that you're married in one state, you're married in another, you're divorced in one state, you're divorced in all of them, that kind of thing. They They have to recognize those particular things. The most recent controversy, which is a couple years ago, it was still a controversy, it's not anymore. This is in the end when the Supreme Court decided that um, states had to had to recognize uh, gay marriage from other states, they ended up using the full faith and credit clause to make that happen. Okay, another way that states have obligations to each other is extradition, uh, meaning that states are generally not able to harbor criminals from another state. And the process is, is that they have to work it out. And essentially the governors of their offices, of course, work together to extradite those who are accused of criminal crimes or of criminal activity. Uh, for instance, you commit a crime in Georgia um, and you flee to South Carolina and they catch you in South Carolina. There is this process of extradition where the governor um, the governor's office of Georgia will go to the governor's office of South Carolina and say, hey, we'd like that guy back. Um, there's a there's a court hearing almost all the time, and then they get sent back. It is, we have to remember, it's not mandatory. However, as you might imagine, the states almost always cooperate with each other because if uh, South Carolina didn't cooperate with Georgia, then the next time around, if it was flipped the other way around and South Carolina wanted somebody back that had fled to Georgia, the George, then Georgia might not work with them. So they almost always do that. About the only time you see that they don't do that anymore is with a perhaps a case where a crime was committed um, in a state with the death penalty and the person flees and is caught in a state that doesn't have the death penalty. There will be times that, that the governors of those states um, might say, we're not going to extradite this person back to you unless you um, make sure that the death penalty is off the table. Um, and that has happened in the past. It's not something that happens very often, but it is something to kind of illustrate the fact that it is not mandatory to do this. Okay, additional obligations. Privileges and immunities is the most complicated part of this, and you're going to see why. The idea is it's supposed to prevent a state from discriminating against citizens of other states. For instance, you can't charge more sales tax to somebody from out of state than in state. You get the same police protection. You can't call up 911 and they can't ask you, well, what state are you from? And if you're not from the state, then you you know, will not send police. You can't do that. Um, so that's the idea. Um, and, and this was said in a Supreme Court ruling. Um, in 1999, California had passed a law that said um, new residents had to wait a year before they were eligible for welfare. And the reason was that people on welfare from some states were going to California specifically because their welfare was better. It was a lot more than in other states. And California decided, oh, we can't have people just come in here willy-nilly um, just because we pay more. And um, it turns out the Supreme Court said they can't do that. You have to, um, you're discriminating against somebody from another state if they move to your state. So you have, they're immediately eligible. Okay, like I said, though, this is much more complicated because there's lots and lots of exceptions. And the one that might strike uh, home for you guys, and you might have already thought of it, is um, something that might affect you next year. If you are going to college out of state, there you might be subject to in-state or out-of-state tuition for you. That is clearly discriminatory against somebody from another state. If you wanna go to the University of Alabama, you're gonna pay out-of-state tuition. You pay more money than a resident of Alabama. That is clearly, like I said, discriminatory, but it is allowed. So there's other exceptions as well. That's why this is complicated. Uh, voting, of course, you can't vote in one state and vote in another state. You just can't. Um, hotel taxes, well, it's not exactly this, but think about who mostly stays in hotels. It's mostly people from somewhere else. 
And so hotel taxes are quite high in most places. And um, so that really ends up being a tax, if you get the idea, on people from out of state. Another area, and there's more than this, firearms as well. For instance, um, if you have a concealed carry permit in Georgia, that doesn't make it okay for you to carry concealed in a different state. There might be an agreement, there might not be. So you always have to be very careful in other states the same way. They don't have reciprocal agreements because they don't have to. Uh, some do, but some don't. So that's just another example of, of an exception. Okay, the last subject is intergovernmental relations. And so we've got a bunch of these to go through. So again, these definitions, I'm gonna go quickly. Dual federalism, and each of these is going to have a, a slide or two on, on the depth, in depth, what you need to know. So it's a system of government with both state and national governments who remain supreme and in their own spheres, each responsible for some policies. The analogy that we use, and we've used for years and years in AP Gov, is a cake analogy. We can use this as layer cake, and you'll see that on the next slide. So think dual federalism is layer cake. Cooperative federalism is a system where the government powers and assignments are shared, they're intermingled, they share costs, administration, sometimes even blame if they're poorly. We think of cooperative federal federalism as the opposite, in essence, of layer cake. It is marble cake, and you'll see that again, intermingled responsibilities. And lastly, fiscal federalism, which is not part of the cake analogy, it's the money part. It's a pattern of spending and taxing that provides grants in the federal system. It is the cornerstone of the national and state relations with local governments. Okay, so yeah, a little bit of history. So dual federalism was the usual way it was thought of until towards the end of the 19th century, towards the um, end of the 1800s. Um, and that is, again, this is layer cake. The layers of government are fairly distinct. Think of that as a cake. If you've got a chocolate layer and a vanilla layer and a cake, those are two separate things. And that's the way it was usually looked at. States had their stuff, national had their stuff, and never or almost never did they intermingle. Whereas um, cooperative federalism is what we have starting there towards the end of the 19th and, of course, 20th century and onward. And that is the idea of marble cake again, mingled responsibilities, blurred distinctions. You know, a, a chocolate and vanilla marble cake has vanilla and chocolate all over the place in different in different areas. So that's that's a great analogy to use. And I always use a good example here, education, since we're all that's why we're here. Um, there is there's been all sorts of things where the national government and the um, state government have uh, have intermingled you know, all the way back even to to prior to the Constitution, the Northwest Territory, land-grant colleges. And then if you remember from last year, National Defense Education Act after Sputnik, when the Soviets launched Sputnik, the first satellite, um, we went into overdrive and started providing money for education from the national level because it was a defense priority. Um, grants um, and things for federal aid for schools, um, for federal aid for college, you know, the things that you're going to get, um, school lunch stuff, snacks in schools, all sorts of stuff like that have, have come from the federal level. So it's an intermingled educational thing. It's a great example to use. Okay, so let's talk more about cooperative federalism. We'll talk about it with the highway system, the interstate system, U.S. highways. Both sides, the state and the national government, have to uh, supply funds for this. And here's what cooperative involves. It involves shared cost. States have to supply funding. Um, that they have to follow federal guidelines to get it. So they come with strings attached. Cooperative federalism is much more about strings attached to the federal money. If you want it, you got to follow these rules. And things like drinking agent speed limit with highway funds, we talked about that before. It's the same idea here. You also share administration. States have some latitude in the way they spend it, and they're the ones who administer it, but they really have to follow the guidelines. Okay, so fiscal federalism then, um, the last subject here, um, it involves the grant system. And there are two big um, categories or ideas we have to have here. First of all, it's the category that's called categorical grants or categorical grants in aid. Same thing. Depends how you see it. You'll, it all means the same thing. And that is the grants that really come with strings. They're very specific from the national government to the states. You must use it for these specific purposes in state and local spending. 
So again, lots and lots of strings come with categorical grants. That was very common in the 60s and 70s with strings that non-discrimination. And when we say strings, we don't mean not necessarily a bad thing. Non-discrimination clauses are good things. Um, union wages, that depends on your point of view. Environmental impact statements and all sorts of things that they have to follow if they want the money. Block grants are a different idea. Block grants are more of grants given to states for broad-based stuff. For instance, here's your money for welfare. Georgia, you decide how much you want to spend on Section 8, how much you want to spend on food stamps, how much you want to spend on this program and that program. Um, so a lot less strings. That's the way to look at it. They have a lot of discretion, not one size fits all because California and Georgia and Minnesota and Michigan are different. Um, they have discretion on how to use them, how they see fit. And again, more common in the 80s and 90s, you can look at it as more of a liberal idea on, in the ideological spectrum. Lots of strings, more on the conservative ideas, less strength, more state um, discretion. Over time, though, the strings start to become attached to making those things less effective with the block grants. All right, last two slides and then mandates, and I gotta go through this quickly because I'm running out of time. Those are requirements that direct states to comply with federal rules under threat of not receiving the grant. Uh, Medicaid is a great example of this. Remember, Medicaid is the program for poor people, not the program for old people, that's Medicare. Congress has increased and expanded the Medicaid idea and who's eligible dramatically and it's forced the states to comply and that has caused a real burden for the states because the states a lot of times can't afford it and they don't get enough money from the national government to help them. Um, another example, which is the American, Americans with Disabilities Act. This gives us uh, rise to another term we have to know. When Congress passed this, and that's the law that requires, you know, um, handicap ramps and, and handicap bathrooms and handicapped uh, parking spots and all of that stuff. All of the stuff with, which are good things. But when Congress passed it, they forced state and local governments to comply, but they didn't supply any money. So it comes with this last term for us, unfunded mandates. We have to know what those are. Those are the requirements by Congress. I'll go back to that. Those are requirements by, go back. Oops. Requirements by, oh, well, we can't go back. Um, last slide. Mandates. Mandates and the unfunded mandates were limited by the Republican wave in 94. That's when um, the Republicans took control of the House of Representatives, Representatives for the first time in over 40 years. In addition, federal courts also create mandates. States have to cope with things like illegal aliens. If the federal government doesn't deal with it or they don't enforce it and let them in, states end up having to deal with the problem and the federal government doesn't give them money to do that. So it turns out it can be an unfunded mandate. The Supreme Court, however, has limited the reach of mandates lately. Um, and this is the last thing, Brady Handgun Control Act for state and local law enforcement officers to act as federal agents to perform background checks for handgun purchases with no funds. The Supreme Court said, you can't do that. You went too far. If you wanted those people to act as federal agents, you were going to have to supply money for them to do it. So that should be it for, uh, for what we have today. Make sure you know unfunded mandates. Uh, make sure you are ready for the test. All of this stuff will be will be in its learning very shortly. Um, and currently at issue, the last thing, sanctuary cities, that's in the courts right now. Um, can the national government say, you can't have this money unless you follow the laws? And so that's, again, that'll be in court for a long time. So anyway, so that's the last of it. Um, test is coming up. And um, I'll have another uh, video for you about the two court cases coming up. So uh, good luck on the test. We'll see you in unit two.